Okay, guys, we are going to continue our discussion on uh, fatty acid metabolism. Uh, when we left off on our last lecture, we were talking about how the fatty acids are mobilized, where they're, uh, how they're brought from the adipose tissue to contracting skeletal muscle, how they enter the muscle. Um, we talked about how they have to be activated and converted so they can get inside of the mitochondria. Well, today we're going to kind of do a deep dive into the mitochondria. And this is coming from chapter 18 of your textbook, uh, and it's starting on page 216. And uh, there's going to be a lot of information here, but it's not necessary for your final exam. Um, and what I'm going to be doing is while I'm... So throughout this lecture, I'm also going to tie it to uh, our paper that you guys have to present on your for your final exam. Now, by no means are you going to be black belts in understanding this paper, but you should be much further along than you were when you started. And if you ask me, it's a kind of a nice, easy way to end uh, the semester because you've already read this and you already presented on it a little bit. And now um, we're going to talk about the the um, mitochondria portion of this, okay? And, and if you look at uh, my paper, I put in pink all of the references to mitochondria. So we'll go through this. You can see here, right, we have the mitochondria. Here we have the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle, which is what we're talking about today. We're talking about beta oxidation, right? So uh, we're talking about um, these, these lipids, right, or these fatty acids that are going to enter um, the mitochondria and be metabolized for energy. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of be going back and forth from this to this. And I just, I just want to kind of prepare you for that. Um, so let's, let's get into the lecture here. So we're essentially talking about cellular respiration right now. And when we're talking about respiration, we're, we're talking about uh, how we're creating energy at rest. So when you're just sitting right now, of course, you're working um, probably about 80 to 90 percent of your metabolism is coming from uh, the fatty acids being sent through the Krebs cycle and then through the electron transport chain. And essentially that's creating ATP, right? And, and there's some familiar things here, right? We know that um, during glycolysis, we'll produce some of these electron carriers called NADH. And we'll talk about those in quite a bit of detail today. Um, we know that NADH and glycolysis can both produce ATP. We talked about that. You presented on that um, in your third exam when we talked about glycolysis. We know that if we're exercising uh, at a low capacity or low intensity, that sugar can be converted into pyruvate, and then pyruvate can enter the mitochondria, right? So this would be in the cytosol, as this indicates here. And then when we get into the mitochondria, there's all this machinery in there that will help break pyruvate down um, into more ATP, right? So we'll be talking about the Krebs cycle today. We'll be going into a little bit of the electron transport chain. You can see that these electron carriers, NADH and FADH2, which you should be familiar with from glycolysis, uh, FADH2 is produced here in the Krebs cycle as well. Uh, these will be transported to the electron transport chain to uh, uh, ultimately create ATP. So this process is called oxidative phosphorylation, okay, phosphorylation. Um, and this is kind of what we're going to work on today. So here's the big picture. This is where we left off. This is what you guys presented on. And now we're going to focus on this lower intensity, lower intensity exercise story and start moving into the mitochondria. So here is a picture of the mitochondria. And uh, obviously, you know, this is the powerhouse of the cell. It produces the most ATP. And there's a couple of components to it that you might be familiar with. You might not be familiar with it. Uh, we have the matrix, which if you look here, it's kind of this empty space inside of the mitochondria. Um, the mitochondria has two membranes. It has an outer membrane and it has an inner membrane. And uh, we have specific transporters that will bring fatty acids across both the outer and the inner membrane. And then we have the cristae. Um, and I, I will I will draw these things for you momentarily, but I just want to introduce it. So here's a pretty hand-drawn picture of it. And this is what it looks like inside of human skeletal muscles. So this would be electron microscopy that is showing what mitochondria looks like. And if you follow my cursor, eh, let me just, let me just 
draw some things here. If you follow my cursor, this would be the outer mitochondria membrane. And then you can see another one right here, which would be the inner mitochondria membrane. Okay. And we're going to talk about both of those. Um, the function of the CAC, which I'm just shorthanding, which stands for citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle, also known as the TCA cycle. There's all these really interesting names because scientists just can't, uh, they just can't make up their minds. So um, just some basics about it, just in case you're not familiar with what it is. So it is the final uh, oxidative pathway that oxidizes acyl-CoA to CO2 and uh, water and also ATP. Um, it is the source of reduced enzymes that provide substrates for the respiratory chain. So what are those um, what are those reduced coenzymes? Those are your NADH, right? That's that's an H, not a P, and your F A D F A D H. I swear by the time I'm done with this class, I will be ambidextrous and I can write with my right hand. Um, so that is the final resting place for those as well. And they are going to provide substrates for the respiratory chain, which is going to produce ATP. Um, it acts like a link between catabolic and anabolic pathways. Okay, so there's that word that you guys should be familiar with as well. Um, because both catabolic and anabolic pathways are going to be occurring in the citric acid cycle, just like we saw in glycolysis. So they're both going to be happening there. Um, it provides a precursor for synthesis of amino acids and nucleotides, just like uh, glycolysis provide a, provided a um, pathway for the synthesis of amino acids. This performs a very uh, particular role like that as well. Um, and another thing is, this is, for the sake of this course, this is where our oxidation of fatty acids are going to occur during aerobic exercise, and it's going to produce ATP as a result, and we will be able to exercise longer within that aerobic um, pathway when we strengthen this system. So when we purposely strengthen uh, our mitochondria density, which means we create a lot more mitochondria, and that's one of the adaptations that is going to occur. All right. Um, so the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, there are several phases to it, just like what we saw in glycolysis. Okay. I'm going to go through those phases a, a little bit quicker, um, simply because I want to get to more of this than I do want to talk about, uh, the phases of the citric acid, uh, citric acid acid cycle, sorry. So essentially it's composed of eight enzymes, just like we talked in glycolysis, right? Glycolysis had, I believe it was 12 enzymes, right? Um, all of which are in the mitochondria matrix. Okay. So let's, oops, sorry. Let's go back. Let's look at the matrix, right? Uh, here is the matrix. So this is kind of like the empty space inside of the mitochondria, right? You see that? This is the matrix. So the matrix, just follow my pen, is kind of in the center of the mitochondria, and there's lots of space in there, uh, so enzymatic reactions can occur. Um, oops, let me go back. So, um, and this basically is uh, the final stage of respiration where we're going to have uh, the electron transport chain create energy uh, through something called ATP synthase. And we'll, we'll talk about that um, in a little bit as well, okay? So there's there's a couple of stages here, um, and we can have the oxidation of glucose, like I told you about earlier with pyruvate, right? And that will be converted to CO2, okay? Or we can also bring in fatty acids, and fatty acids can be oxidized, and we can create energy that way, all right? So just, just a couple of points that I want to talk about with uh, the preparatory steps. So in order for fatty acids to be used or for any other um, fuel to get inside of the mitochondria, it has to be prepared. And the language that the mitochondria uses is this guy right here, acyl-CoA. All right. 
So if something wants to get inside the mitochondria, it's going to have to get converted to this first. Now let's put this to the test. Let's see if I can, uh, if we look at glucose, right? When we have glycolysis occur, let me get a different colored pen so it shows up a little better for you guys. Let's do red. When we have glycolysis, right, glucose enters the cell. It gets converted into pyruvate. And if pyruvate wants to go inside of the mitochondria, it has to get converted to acyl-CoA right there, right, before it gets sent into the TCA cycle. And the TCA cycle, like I said, is also the Krebs cycle, which is also the citric acid cycle, right? It's all the same. So the language that the mitochondria wants to speak is acyl-CoA language, all right? So if you want the mitochondria to metabolize and create energy, um, substrates have to be converted into acyl-CoA. Let's look at fatty acids. Fatty acids will enter the cell, okay? And fatty acids will be activated into acyl-CoA. And then fatty acids will use carnitine and the activated acyl-CoA, and it will enter the mitochondria, okay? And you can see here there's something called a CPT, which is a transporter, Okay, here you can see an MPC, which is a transporter, right? It can't just get into the mitochondria matrix. It has to interact with a gatekeeper that is on the outer membrane, all right? So if we go back here, I drew these outer and inner membranes. The outer membranes have these gatekeepers, right, in order for substrates to get in. Likewise, the inner membrane also has some gatekeepers as well. So these, these fuels, they can't just get inside they are highly, highly regulated. And in order to get inside, they have to be converted um, into something the mitochondria recognizes. We won't talk about glutamine. That's not necessary for this class. But you can see that right in the middle. Let me clean this. Let's back this up. Let's clean this up. Uh, and let's erase. You can see right in the middle of the mitochondria, right? Here's that empty space. Here's that empty space. There's the TCA cycle, right? It's right in the matrix or, or the Krebs cycle or the um, citric acid cycle, right? Um, and acyl-CoA, acetyl-CoA, sorry, is this is the mitochondria currency. So if glucose wants to get in, it has to be converted to acetyl-CoA. If pyruvate wants to get in, well, pyruvate's a part of glucose, so we don't need to mention that, but if fatty acids want to get in, it has to be converted into acetyl-CoA. If ketone or amino acids want to get in to be metabolized, that also has to be converted into acetyl-CoA. Um, and we would see this during exercise. If we're doing low-intensity exercise, we would see glucose entering the mitochondria to be generated as energy. Uh, if we're doing moderate to low intensity exercise and we're running and we're doing aerobic exercise, you're going to have a combination of glucose and fatty acids coming into the cell and getting converted. And then when we are in a depleted state, let's say we are calorie restricted or we're overtraining and we're, we're depleted of glucose and fatty acids, well, then amino acids can be used and converted to energy. And those also have to be converted to that, um, acetyl-CoA. So I hope that makes sense. All right. So the big takeaway message here is if we want things to burn and be utilized for energy in the mitochondria, the mitochondria has to understand what's coming in. And in order for it to accept what is coming in, those things have to be converted to acetyl-CoA. Okay. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, so here we could see some of those steps in, in just a little bit more detail, okay? So um, what we can see in this slide here is the enzymes responsible for taking acetyl-CoA and fatty acids and basically breaking them down so that we can make uh, energy through the electron transport chain. And this would be fatty acids. And over here, you could see glucose also uses the exact same or exact same enzymes, right? Citrate, alpha-ketoglutarate, um, fumarate, right? Um, oxalacetate, same thing, ox 
oxaloacetate, citrate, alpha-ketoglutamate, right? Malate, we see the same things except for this malate and this fumarate. Those, those are slightly different. But when we talk about the citric acid cycle, we talk about the Krebs cycle, we're just talking about a couple of enzymes here that are going to break down acetyl-CoA and start generating some energy, okay? And you don't need to worry about, you know, these things over here. Uh, we don't care about that for this course. You don't need to really worry about any of these purple things here. Um, not at the moment anyways, but what's going to happen is these things are going to come in and just like glycolysis, they're going to be broken down. And I'll show you those steps and those sequences momentarily. All right, so let me uh, do a little bit of drawing here for you so we can look at the big picture before we uh, really start talking about the mitochondria and the matrix and uh, all the machinery and hardware, <clears throat> excuse me, inside the mitochondria. Um, so I'm going to draw a picture for you here, and let's just say that we're talking about a big cell, okay? There's the cell. Let's say this is skeletal muscle cell. And then right here, we are going to have a transporter. And that transporter, here's the cell membrane. Let's just kind of draw that, right? And then it looks like a membrane, right? It looks like a membrane. Um, this transporter is called CD36. And we know that this is a fatty acid transporter. Okay, so uh, if we have, uh, let's say over here, we have a blood vessel, right? And inside of the blood vessel, we have fatty acids, and uh, those are bound to albumin. I'm just going to put ALB because albumin are protein transporters. Well, when the fatty acids get near the muscle that is contracting, they're going to be released. Okay, we have the fatty acids. The fatty acids are going to enter the cell and then they have to get converted. There's a couple of things that have to happen in order for the cell, or I'm sorry, in order for the fatty acids to get to the mitochondria. Okay, a couple of things have to occur. Okay, and in order for the fatty acids to get inside, and be metabolized for energy, uh, the fatty acids first have to be activated, okay? So the fatty acids are in the cytosol. I'm just going to put uh, fatty acid, F-A. And essentially what is going to occur is the fatty acids are going to interact with something that I, I've kind of been mentioning quite, quite a bit, um, which is going to be Acyl-CoA, okay? And acyl-CoA is, um, it's, it's a type of an enzyme, right? So the enzyme is going to activate the fatty acids uh, so that it speaks a language that the mitochondria can understand, okay? So when we have fatty acids bound to acyl-CoA, now that tells the cell that the fatty acids are ready to be um essentially uh, metabolized, but they need the help from a buddy. And that buddy is going to be called something called carnitine. I don't, I don't know if you've heard this word before, um, but carnitine is going to be a transporter that's going to help guide the fatty acid acyl-CoA uh, molecule into the mitochondria. So what's going to happen is the fatty acid acyl-CoA is going to bind to the carnitine and then we are going to get something called acyl carnitine okay i hope that's spelled right acyl carnitine okay now acyl carnitine is capable of getting past one of the membranes all right so as I told you before, the mitochondria has two membranes. It has an inner and an outer membrane. 
Well, if we zoom in, and it's not gonna let me zoom in, so what I'm gonna do is let me, let me erase this mitochondria and let me draw the membranes a little thicker so that it makes a tad bit more sense, okay? So we have the outer membrane of the mitochondria, okay? And then, I'll choose a different color, we have, let's do green. We have the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Okay, that's the membrane. Okay, and then inside down here, we have the matrix. IX. Okay, so we have this molecule now called acylcarnitine. And acylcarnitine is going to be created by this enzyme called CPT1, right? So right here, we are going to have an enzyme called CPT1. Um, it, it's a very, very long name. Um, and basically, it's a transferase. So it's carnitine palmitoid transferase. That's what that stands for. And all I really want you to focus on is the T because that's transferase, which means it's going to transfer something, right? So what CPT1 is going to do is it's going to bind the carnitine to the acyl-CoA. And now the fatty acid bound to the acyl-carnitine is allowed to move into the space between the inner and outer membrane, right? So now we have this molecule, and I'm just going to say acyl carnitine sitting in here. And the reason that could get inside is because CPT1 let carnitine bind to acyl CoA, right? To this guy right here. And that's what allowed it to move past the first membrane. Okay, so what's going to happen now is on the inner membrane, we're going to have two more enzymes that are going to cause some reactions that are going to allow this acyl carnitine to get inside, inside into the matrix, okay? So we are going to have something called, let me draw it here first. I'll play some Jeopardy music in the background while I'm uh, drawing this. We are going to have C. A, C, T, okay? And then we are going to have, let's change the color, something called C, P, T, 2, okay? And C, P, T, 2 is the same thing as C, P, T, 1, but it's going to reverse the action, uh, reverse a reaction, okay? So the C, A, C, T is called carnitine acyl carnitine translocase okay that's what that stands for and translocase means it's going to let this acyl carnitine whoops let me get that out acyl carnitine transfer inside the mitochondria okay so we had cpt1 which basically said hey let's do a math problem fatty acid plus Acyl-CoA, okay, CPT1 is going to bind those two to the carnitine transporter, okay? So that's what CPT1 did. It took acyl-CoA and fatty acids and it bound it to carnitine and now carnitine can move past the membrane, okay? The CACT protein is going to let the acyl carnitine move from the space between the outer and inner membrane, and it's going to let it get into the mitochondria, okay? Now, the CPC2 is going to do the opposite of the CPT1. It's going to break apart carnitine and acyl-CoA so that acyl-CoA can move to go get metabolized. So once 
acetylcarnitine is inside the matrix. It's going to interact with CPT2, and CP2 is going to separate acyl-CoA from carnitine. And that is how your fatty acid is going to get from the blood into the muscle, into the mitochondria, and this is going to be occurring while you are doing low intensity exercise. That's why it takes a little bit of time to get into the aerobic metabolism because all these reactions have to happen first. Um, so that is how fatty acids get in. And now let's take a moment and talk about this uh, citric acid cycle. Okay, so here we go again. I, I have the um, outer mitochondria membrane. I'm just beating a dead horse here, right? Outer, I put it in black. Inner, I put it in orange. And we know, uh, let's just kind of repeat uh, what we were talking about. We know that in order for acyl-CoA to get from the outside to the inside, it has to interact with CPT1, which is going to add the carnitine to it, right? So inside here, we will have, um, we will have the acyl carnitine, right? And then we know that there is a, another membrane or another enzyme here, the CACT enzyme, which is going to allow acyl carnitine to move into the matrix. And then we know we are going to have one more enzyme here. And I think I did it in yellow before. I'm going to try to keep my colors straight here. So let's just give it a yellow outline which is CPT2. And CP2 is going to separate carnitine from acyl-CoA. So now we have, we have acyl-CoA and carnitine. I'm just gonna put C-A-R for carn. Okay. Now, we're not going to talk about beta oxidation in detail because it's just going to weigh you guys down with a lot of unnecessary detail. It is very important because in order for acyl-CoA to enter the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, it must be converted again. And this time, it must be converted to something called acetyl-CoA. So um, it's slightly different. So acyl-CoA is going to undergo a process called beta oxidation. And at the end of beta oxidation, it's going to spit out a new product called acetyl-CoA. And I'm going to spell it for you. A. So it sounds the same, but spelled slightly different. E. T. Y. L. CoA. C-O-A, sorry, okay? So this is acyl, this is acetyl. So beta oxidation turns acyl-CoA into acetyl-CoA, and acetyl-CoA is the only molecule that can enter the Krebs cycle. So I'm trying to show you how complex this is and why when we exercise aerobically, it takes such a long time to get that second wind, right? And that second wind is us basically generating enough energy via aerobic pathways in order to keep exercising in that type of a manner. So it takes a little bit of time, right? We talked about how the fatty acid is out here. The fatty acid has to get activated with acyl-CoA, right? Then acyl-CoA has to interact with this and a carnitine has to be put on it. And then it could pass here and then it could pass here and then the CPT2 takes that carnitine off and then acyl-CoA has to undergo beta oxidation and then it has to be turned into acetyl-CoA, which now acetyl-CoA can interact with the Krebs cycle to start generating some energy. Um, and that's where we're gonna pick up right now. So the first thing that is going to happen in the Krebs cycle is we are gonna have something called oxal acetate, and I'll draw it for you, O-X-A, 
L O A C E T A T E. And oxoacetate, let's go back to our, our favorite friends here, the carbons. Oxoacetate is a one, two, three, four, four carbon molecule. Now, oxoacetate is going to interact with acetyl CoA, okay? And it's going to look like this acetyl CoA is going to bind to oxoacetate. Okay, so it's going to shh, it's going to bind to let's put acetyl CoA right here's A C E T uh, Y L CoA and these guys are going to start sharing their carbons. So um, acetyl CoA is a two carbon molecule. Okay. So what's going to happen is there's going to be an enzyme called citrate synthase, right? And it's going to make this reaction occur, okay? Citrate syn, am I spelling that right? Thase, okay? And citrate synthase is an enzyme. And it's going to take the four carbons from oxal acetate and it's going to bind them to the two carbons from acetyl-CoA. So we're going to get one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so the first step inside of the citric acid cycle is oxal acetate combining with the acetyl-CoA to make a six carbon molecule. And that six carbon molecule is created by an enzyme called citrate synthase. Okay, now when we have a six carbon molecule, we have a new molecule, let me change the color here, that is called citric acid. Okay, so an another name for this citric acid is also just citrate. Um, oh, I lost my pen, okay, there it is. So I can either call this citric acid or I can just call it citrate. You'll, you'll see it a couple of different ways. C-I-T-R-A-T-E. Okay, so now citrate is a new substrate, okay? And we have this six carbon molecule called citrate. I'm just gonna draw it like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, the reason I'm showing you these carbons is because we're going to start losing carbons and when we lose the carbons, it's helping us essentially generate more energy. So what's gonna happen now is this citrate is going to be converted into something called isocitrate, okay? So citrate is going to be converted, let me get a new color here, let's do red, to something called isocitrate. Okay? And um, this occurs by another enzyme. Uh, we're not going to talk about this enzyme. It's not really that important at the moment because isocitrate is still a six carbon molecule. So let's draw some carbons. Isocitrate, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. We still have six carbons. So isocitrate is now going to undergo something called dehydrogenase, uh, dehydrogenase right? We're gonna, we're gonna lose some hydrogens here. And we're also going to uh, wind up with a five carbon molecule. So here's where we're going to lose a molecule. And when we lose a hydrogen, right? we're going to start creating some energy. So isocitrate, let me change it to black, is going to get converted to something called alpha keta glutamate. And I will spell that for you. So hang on, let me just get a different color here and we will do, uh, let's do blue. And we will draw alpha keta glutarate as blue, okay? So I'm going to say A L P H A alpha K 
keto, right? Just like uh, ketones. Glut rate. Okay. And what's interesting about alpha keta glutarate is that is a one, two, three, four, five. It is a five carbon molecule. So we went from six carbons to five carbons. So that means that we lost a carbon. And generally what happens is we lose that carbon as CO2. All right, we also lost the hydrogen here. So what happens with this conversion from isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate is we have, what happens when we lose the hydrogen is we start to make NADH. And look at what's at the end there. We have a hydrogen, okay? So the conversion from isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate is going to happen by another enzyme called axylosuccinate. And I'll spell that for you guys. And again, it's not like very important that you know these enzymes that create the reactions. I'm just trying to show you the process, okay? So that enzyme is spelled O X. A L O S U C C I N A T E. Okay? So from the conversion from isocitrate, which is a six carbon molecule, to the to the generation of a new substrate, which is alpha ketoglutarate, that's a five carbon molecule. In that process, we lose a carbon, right? SCO2, and we lose a hydrogen, but we generate NADH. So that is how we start generating more energy in the Krebs cycle. So I don't want to lose focus on the big picture. So why am I explaining all of these little pieces to you? Well, because here is a big chunk of that story I'm telling you, and this might be something you want to discuss in your final exam if, if this is making sense to you. So here's the exact same picture I drew you. Here's fatty acids, and it's in the blood, right? It's in the capillaries. And the fatty acids get into the skeletal muscle cell through the CD36 transporter. They can't come in unless they are being transported in, right? And then the free fatty acids, FFA, are going to be activated by acyl-CoA. So let me see if I can draw here. Can I get a pen? Here we go. It looks like I have one. So here you should recognize the acyl-CoA that is connected to the fatty acid, okay? Now, this picture doesn't do as much justice as what I had done, but you should recognize the CPT1 transport protein, right? We know that the CPT1 is going to add a carnitine. I'm just gonna put C, right? It's gonna add a carnitine, and then, oh, that's an O. Let me see. I might not have the right tool here. Let me see if I can pick a different. Let's try this guy. Uh, it adds a carnitine. That looks like a C. Bad color. Uh, can I change it? Let's do uh, Let's do something that's going to pop out. Uh, a red, I suppose. Okay. It's going to add a carnitine. That pops out a little better, right? And then acyl carnitine is going to go through the CPT1 in between the inner and outer membrane this picture just shows you an outer membrane that's okay then it's going to transfer through the cact into the inner membrane into the matrix and then that cpt2 is going to rip apart the acyl coa and the carnitine so here's the beta oxidation process and i drew this for you so now we have the acyl coa with the fatty acid it's going to undergo beta oxidation and the ultimate goal is to convert it to acetyl-CoA and acetyl-CoA is what can enter the mitochondria I'm sorry not the mitochondria the citric acid cycle which is what we're talking about now I've taken you here to oxal acetate that starts about here and then we talked about citrate and then we talked about isocitrate and then we talked about let's clean that up right here we talked about alpha ketoglutarate so this is where we are and you can see that we are going to start generating some energy here 
right? So I'm going to stop here with the drawing because on the next little lecture, I'm going to finish this. I don't want to completely overwhelm you because there's a lot to chew on here. But the story is in front of you right now. So this giant page um, in your in your uh, paper, uh, I just told you that story. So so what does exercise do? So how, what is what is how does exercise change this? Well, some research out there has shown that. Oop, let's pull this over here. Some research has shown that. Can I pick a different color? Let's see. Yep. Some research has shown. I'll get to it eventually. There we go. That CPT1 transporters. We get more of them, right? And if we get more of these C CPT1 transporters, well, that means that we could process more of the fatty acid and the acyl CoA. We can get them in there faster, right? Some other research has shown that the um, citrate synthase, right, which is that enzyme I told you that turns uh, oxalacetate into citric acid. I'll just put that right here. Let's see if I can draw. Um, let's see if I can draw that. Here we go. So I'm just going to say C. Is it doing it? Nope, it's not doing it. Did I turn it off? I turned it off. Here we go. C. S, that's a bad color. Let me do it one more time. I apologize. Bear with me here. C, okay. Bop, bop. Okay. Citrate synthase, which is the enzyme that turns the four carbon molecule from oxalacetate into a six carbon molecule, which is citrate. This enzyme is also upregulated when we exercise. So that means that genes in your DNA are turning on and producing more messenger RNA that will create more of this citrate synthase protein, right? Not only is that enzyme going to increase, but genes that are encoded for this CPT1 protein, they're going to be activated and we're going to get RNA polymerase that's going to read the DNA sequence that codes for these CPT1s. And those are going to get turned into proteins and put inside of the membrane. So this is how we get in better shape when we are doing aerobic exercise. Likewise, there has also been research that has shown that we get more CD36. Um, let me see if I can put more of those. There we go. We get more CD36 transporters in the membrane up here. Oh, that, that's too far up there. Okay, let's put it there. Doom. Okay, so when we exercise specifically in an aerobic capacity for a long period of time, we have these changes inside of the cell. We get more CD36 uh, transporters. We get more CPT1 transporters. We get more CPT, CPT. T, sorry, CPT2 transporters. We get more citrate synthase uh, activity and more citrate synthase expression. So the genes are turning on all of these, um, uh, the, the genes are being exposed to RNA polymerase to, to create all of these proteins, which means you can mobilize fat faster you can metabolize fat faster, and you could ultimately create more ATP because of all these things. And the ATP creation is going to happen right over here in the electron transport chain. And we are going to talk about that in a shorter lecture this week, okay? So ultimately, we are going to use all of these NADHs and FADHs that we create in the citric acid cycle to help generate ATP in the electron transport chain because look at where those go, okay? Right there is it. Oh, geez, that's not right. Right there is an NADH. And then over here, we use FADH2. So these electron carriers are going to move over here and help generate ATP. Now, if we look at this a little bit more, um, I highlighted in pink where it talks a lot about mitochondria changes in skeletal muscle. So if we look here, oh, geez, what's going on here? Can I, can I just look at a single page? Okay, that should work. So this is saying here that training-induced adaptations are reflected by changes in contractile protein and function of the mitochondria, okay? 
So you can see, I just showed you how contracting skeletal muscle in an aerobic capacity changes the architecture of the skeletal muscle where we can process more of these metabolic uh, processes, okay? So this is telling you that one of the ways, one of the things that happens is we have changes in the skeletal muscle where we get more of the mitochondria um, hardware where we can process more of the fatty acids coming in. So here's another little thing here. So it says that um, we turn on genes. You see that there? We have transcription that include turning on genes, genes that help process carbohydrate metabolism, genes that help process lipid mobilization, lipid transport, and lipid oxidation. So let's go back to that picture, okay? Lipid transport, here's free fatty acids. Free fatty acids are a lipid. We transport them into the cell because now we have CD36. We have more of them from exercising. We have more transporters here, right? CPT1, CPT1, CPTP1. We have CPT2 transporters in there as well. And then we increase some of the uh, enzyme activity, which is going to help metabolize more, okay? So the, the paper is telling you that these are some of the changes that occur. And this is um, ultimately talking about fatty acids. Now, if you look here, it also says mitochondria biogenesis. Do you see that there? So that means not only does the mitochondria begin to change because uh, we put in more of these transporters, we increase enzyme speed, we create more of this NADH, but we also start creating more mitochondria as a result. So now we have more mitochondria stocked with more of this machinery that helps us metabolize more of the fatty acids, which helps us create more of the ATP. And if we look down here um, at this particular picture, it's showing you, right? We talked a lot about these um, transcription factors. If we look at lipid metabolism, right? These are the transcription factors that bind to the DNA that tell the DNA to expose the genes or the nucleotides that will create more of these proteins that we're talking about, right? The CD36, the CPT1s and CPT2s, the uh, citrate synthase enzyme. Um, these, these genes are told to create more of those by certain transcription factors. And in this case, when we're talking about lipid metabolism, which is free fatty acids, we're talking about PCG1-alpha, we're talking about PPARs, we're talking about FOXO, we're talking about ERA-alpha. Uh, so if you, if you are doing, uh, if you're gonna talk about some of these in your final project, because you like talking about the, the fatty acid component, and you don't know what those are, well, look at here. Let's go back into the paper, and I highlighted those for you. So we're, here we're talking about, um, here's eras, right? Here's that transcription factor. And it tells you when that transcription factor binds to the DNA, it increases mitochondria enzyme activity, okay? And then there's another one here. Uh, it doesn't mention AMPK, but it does mention, where are the other ones at? It does mention, so here are the PPARs, right? You see that? And the PPARs, when the PPARs are activated, let me, sh let me show you, let's go back. Okay, we're talking about lipid metabolism. Here's a PPAR right here. So when that transcription factor binds to the DNA, that's going to tell the DNA to expose genes to help better metabolize fatty acids. Okay, so if we go back up, we go here, we zoom out, let's come over here, we zoom in. We have the PPARs, and look at what happens when we activate PPARs. We get more, let's see where it talks, oxidative gene expression. So we, we upregulate more hardware to help with oxidative metabolism, which is what we're doing in um, uh, aerobic activity. Okay, I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to let you guys digest this, and then I'll have one more small little lecture uh, about the electron transport chain, and then I'm going to set you free uh, to do your final projects.